Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for this advanced track where we'll talk about how you can take your ML career to the next level. My name is Priya, and I lead the TensorFlow Extended team at Google. I'm very excited to be your moderator for this session today. I'll begin by briefly introducing all of our speakers today. We have Chip Huen, who teaches ML systems design at Stanford and has founded a real-time ML startup and has helped some of world's largest companies like NVIDIA and Netflix deploy ML systems. Welcome, Chip. We have Lawrence Moroni, who leads AI advocacy at Google and has been an instructor for many popular online ML courses, such as TensorFlow specializations from deeplearning.ai. Welcome, Lawrence. We have Jalin Huang, who is senior UX researcher at Facebook and has worked at Amazon and Microsoft as a research scientist and a data scientist on ML applications of human-centered data. Welcome, Jalin. And last but not the least, we have Noel Silver, who is AI ML specialist at Red Hat and um, founder CEO of AI Leadership Institute and has won multiple awards, including the Microsoft Most Valuable Professional Award for Artificial Intelligence. Welcome, Noel. Without further ado, let's get to the talks. Lawrence, take it away. All right, thank you so much, Priya. So, um, my name is Lawrence Moroni, and I'm going to be uh, chatting alongside my good friend Chip, who will join us in a few moments, um, to talk about really gradient ascent for your career. All right, so um, there have been many studies done about the future impact and the future possibilities with artificial intelligence, with machine learning, with deep learning, data science, and all of these new technologies that are coming our way. We hear a lot of hype, but it's really hard for us to put numbers on that. So I wanted to kind of do some studies and to show you some of the projected impact that has been done. And a study performed by Price Waterhouse Coopers estimated that the economic impact driven by AI-related technologies by 2030 is going to be about $15.7 trillion. And yes, that's not a typo. It really is trillion. So the opportunity numerically is massive. Now, we've also looked at what companies are going to be adopting. And over the next seven or eight years, uh, companies, 80% of companies have said they're going to be adopting things like cloud computing, big data analytics, IoT, encryption, cybersecurity, and of course, AI and machine learning. So if you're somebody who's in the technical field, you know, being involved in one of these five is huge, but the AI and machine learning one, I'm going to argue is the biggest because of the number I shared a moment ago. So I always like to uh, do a study of the economic impact of various technologies. And this line may not be very inspiring looking for now, but this is um, a trend line of the GDP of various Western European and United States uh, economies since the 1940s. And we can say, hey, look, there's an overall upwards trend. GDP has generally been growing. There's a big dip on the right, of course, that came around because of the COVID pandemic. But as we can see, overall, the economy generally is rising. And it's hard for us to find maybe something interesting in there. So what I did was I created an analytic of this one where instead of just looking at the overall GDP uh, growth, I wanted to look at each particular's growth as a function of several previous years to that. So we could see where um, the economy was doing particularly well. And more, uh, more interestingly, when the economy was doing particularly well. And I'll start with looking at this one. And you see this circle on the right-hand side, that started right around 2007. And there's this peak where the economy was clearly growing, things were doing very well. Started in 2007, can, maybe can you guess what that might was? What, what was it that brought around that huge economic growth? I'll get back to that in a moment. And if I look at this one, well, that started around 1993, 1994, and that was a long and sustained period of growth. And can you guess what that might be from? Well, I'll give you the answers. The one on the left is really the internet economy. And this was the advent of the web, the browser, and all of that kind of thing. And that brought an explosion in the demand for connectivity. And more importantly, it brought an explosion in demand for people with the skills who can build connected apps, who can build scalable apps. Prior to this, I remember e-commerce sites that were shipped as a compact disc, and you could put together a purchase order by browsing things on the CD and then mail that purchase order in to get something. But of course, the result of this economy and the result of the um, explosion of the web was really e-commerce, online sites, and search engines such as Google. And as a result, we can see you know, the economy changed because of this technological, um, because of these technological advances. And people who were skilled in that could really take benefit of that. And the one on the right, well, of course, that was the advent of the smartphone. 
and the advent of when like the smartphone and the app economy came around. And I read a statistic uh, recently that, you know, despite we can see the dip on the right, but despite that massive dip on the right in the UK, there were a 600,000 net increase in jobs because of the app economy. While every other segment was contracting, jobs as a result of the app economy were actually, you know, um, a growing and growing wildly. All right, so, and uh, if I continue on that note, then when we think about the jobs of tomorrow report from the World Economic Forum, if I want to extrapolate forward, and we can start seeing things like data and AI jobs growing 37%, product development jobs growing 27%, cloud computing, everything is growing hugely. And this jobs of tomorrow report actually cited um, skills in machine learning and AI with TensorFlow as being one of the top skills that people should be looking into if they want to become um, core members of the jobs of tomorrow, that if they want to be able to advance their careers. And then a Forbes report at the same time, you know, shows the global ML market as growing roughly um, year over year between 40 and 50%. So that's the ML market for software revenue, all of those kind of things. And even when we looked at LinkedIn jobs, it's already about 100,000 globally of people who are searching for people to go to work for them with skills in ML. So we see, again, massive, massive growth in this area. So what we've been doing at Google is really to try to train millions of, de oh, sorry, train, um, yeah, millions of developers to reach billions of people. And how do we go about doing that? Well, the goal was to go by the skills required for jobs that you know, I've been mentioning, and they were primarily computer vision, natural language processing, and sequence modeling and to train people in these with various methodologies, with MOOCs, directed scale, sometimes with managed partners, working with universities. And all of this is to lead to what we call the TensorFlow certificate program, where people are able to show their skills in a particular area. And in this case, it's they are skilled in coding machine learning models uh, with the, uh, the, the skills that I mentioned earlier on computer vision, natural language processing, sequence modeling, and make it employment oriented. And, as of now, there's about 5,000 holders globally. Uh, it's a pretty rigorous exam, it's coding oriented, but a major part of our philosophy for this is to widen access as much as possible. So if you're a woman, if you're from an underrepresented group, please, please reach out to us. We have various scholarships and we have various stipends that are available for you. But before I hand over to Chip, I wanna kind of tell a little bit of a story that if you remember when I was talking about this peak, and this peak was the, um, the advent of the internet economy, well, I want to tell the story of a person who was in science and technology right at the beginning of their career before this wave. And they were from a demographic that's not commonly represented in the field. And there was cliches about this demographic as them being generally inferior, stupid, ignorant, and even sometimes violent. Uh, this person, when they were at university, if they ever scored high on an exam, they were usually accused of cheating. Um, when they try to enter the job market, uh, they were generally rejected on account of their demographic. And once they were actually escorted out of a job fair by security, um, one particular time they were detained by the police uh, for no other um, suspicion other than their ethnicity. And when they finally did get a career, there was a concrete ceiling and anything they did well was best met with, are you sure you're Irish? And yes, that person was actually me. And I was able to escape all of that by skilling up into that industry that was in heavy demand at that time. And after that, it was really interesting that people kind of forgot about their prejudices and I was given a chance because I had the skills that were in demand and that concrete ceiling was just gone. And sometimes I tell this story and people find it hard to believe that someone like me, a white man can face such discrimination and be treated so poorly in the workplace. But when you think about it, that's the best possible outcome. And my greatest hope for you, for everybody who's watching this one, if you're women in tech right now, or if you're minorities who you know, are, face discrimination in tech right now, that 20 years from now, you'll be giving a tale and you'll be telling a story to another group of people and they won't believe that you are discriminated against either. So with that, it's like, I always find, you know, this is an amazing opportunity for you to skill up in these things. And if you are facing times of hardship and if you are facing times of discrimination, it really is better to light a single candle, I find, than it is to yell at the darkness. And that's what we're here to help you with. I believe that this next wave of AI is far bigger than the one I was able to take advantage of. The numbers that I shared earlier, hopefully will show you that that is really true. And it's right there for you to take advantage of today. Uh, with uh, thousands of you or millions of you lighting candles and maybe that darkness will go away. 
and we're to help you. And we hope that you know you can have a better life and you can have a better career in machine learning and in AI. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to my friend Chip, who's been immensely and amazingly successful at this. Thank you. Hi everyone. Uh, thanks uh, Lawrence and Priya for the introductions. I'm really excited to be here today. So on my talk, I'm gonna talk about my journey of becoming a machine learning engineer and some of the things I've learned along the way. Usually this is uh, the introduction I give uh, to people when I give a talk. It's like I give a very high level. As in, I have published four best-selling books in Vietnamese. I was a product manager uh, to lead the launch of product, now has 20 million money active users. I went to Stanford studying computer science and got internship at Netflix, and then I joined NVIDIA and Snoco, and now I'm doing my own company. So usually, um, when I give talk like that, people, when I introduce myself like that, people have the expectations of how to become a machine learning engineer, like, oh, you study CS, and then you take machine learning courses, and you get a machine learning job. And it makes it like the, the path very linear. But because today we're talking about career, I want to give in more detail of how the path for me actually looks like. So I started, uh, I started uh, doing math. So I was doing math competitions since I was in third grade. And at some point I realized I didn't like math as much. So I switched, uh, so I actually left school uh, and to, to, do a, to become a product manager. And then I, I realized it's like that not was, wasn't the job I wanted either. And so I started, I went traveling for three years and doing absolutely nothing for my career. But then I started writing about my travel and then I, uh, some publishers read my journal and said, do you want to publish a book? So I published a book. And then I published a book and I thought my dreams had been achieved, but I didn't realize I didn't want that either. Uh, so I went back to school and I studied CS and I applied for a lot of jobs and I got no offers. They got everyone was like, you have no engineering experience. Like, how can I take you seriously when all have, you have ever done is writing? So uh, I started like continuing to open source project and started writing blogs, start trying to teach the course. And eventually it landed my first job as machine learning engineer. So what I want to say is like, is this not a linear process? And it's okay if you don't know what you want to do right now. I don't think I have talked to a lot of people and very few that I met anyone who know what they are talk, what was they want to do with their life. And it's okay to be rejected. And I also want to highlight some uh, numbers that Lawrence gave is about the AI value creations um, is a lot. And a lot of it actually come from outside the traditional internet consumer industry. So we really, really need people from other other industry to take advantage of this huge value creation by AI. So if you come from a non-traditional back, uh, background, like not CS, like you're actually really, we need people like you in a, in a, in machine learning and whatever the recruiter said that you don't have enough engineering experience, like don't, don't trust them. So um, here, I think next we're gonna have by like Jillian and Noah giving really good advice on how to advance your careers. I'm gonna share a little bit of what I have learned through my process of doing machine learning engineering. And I hope that this kind of uh, information can help you take more responsibility at work and all the project entry and, and advance your career. So when I was in school and before I started deploying machine learning, I, I had expectations about what is this gonna be like for my job. So I'm gonna collect data, I'm gonna train a model, I'm gonna deploy a model, and I'm ready to collect my EM bonus. But it's actually not the case when I started. So um, so, so when I first, my first machine learning project, it was so frustrating. So um, I started by like choose a metrics to optimize, for example, like click through rate, and then I collect data, I train the model, and then when I inspect the model results, I realize it's like so many labels are wrong. So it's like, I had to like manually relabel a lot of them. So I train the model again, and then I realize it's like, oh my God, it did really poorly in one class. So it because the class is imbalanced, so we need to like collect more data in that class. So it's kept on going a lot of back and forth, and then finally we got the model out. I was so excited, and then somebody pinged me at 2 a.m. So like, what, wait a second, there's some really weird prediction on that and just realized because of some bias in our data, I didn't perform well on one specific like, subgroup that we didn't test on. So it was like really, really bad. It was a lot of self-doubt. Eventually, everything seemed to be going fine, but then we didn't get enough like metrics push as in the so business metric didn't go up. So the reason is why we chose the wrong metric to optimize. So now we have to like choose another metric, have to start over all again. So it's a, a lot of pain for a lot of crying and praying. Um, but it eventually worked. 
So um, in, 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 uh, in expectations, you think of machine learning as a waterfall model, you do one step and then another, uh, but in reality, it's more of an iterative uh, cycle. So you start from one step and then you go to the next step and then you realize there's a previous step wrong and then go back to it. So there's a lot of back and forth throughout the entire process. Uh, so this is like one of the, and now that we have uh, the setting for what is this life for productions, I want to talk about some of the few other myths that I have encountered. So the first myth, uh, so I teach a lot, I teach students how to deploy machine learning model. And in the beginning, they, a lot of them were like, I'm scared, like deploying is hard. How can we deploy a project at the end of the, of the course? But it turned out like deploying is fairly easy. So like if you want to deploy a model for the friends you play around with, so you can like uh, export a model into uh, into like a TF model or an Onyx model, and then you can uh, upload it to AWS or GCP app engine and get back an endpoint. And then the, you can build like a simple app with Streamlit around it. And then the friends can play around with it. So it's pretty straightforward. If you're familiar with the tools, you can do it in uh, maybe half an hour. But however, deploying reliably is hard. If you want to deploy it at a production ready scale, you want to like serve like million of requests um, every hour, or if you want to like serve like multiple users at the same time, that uh, or you want to keep source server up like 99.999% of the time, it's really hard. Um, so so what, what, what it means is that like, don't be afraid to start deploying, like it's really not that not that difficult. So if you really want to build some apps to like to experience to experience what deploying is like, like please do that. Um, so number another myth is that you only deploy one or two models at the same time at the time. So it comes from a research uh, background when you only work with one model, one project at the time. But whereas in productions you have a lot of model. For example, um, Booking.com has about like 150 models, Uber and Google has thousands of models. Uh, here's a, a study, uh, Netflix showing like what kind of tasks are using machine learning model for and like there are many, many different tasks in machine learning model for us from a content standing to predictions to recommendation. And also um, another myth is that like if we don't do anything, model, model performance remains the same. And I think this myth is less and less becoming a problem because um, now people have been understand more about concept drift. So if you just leave, um, so, so we know that the data distribution changed in the real world. Like what is true today might not be true tomorrow. For example, before COVID, like people like busy restaurants because it means that uh, restaurants is a good one. But then during COVID, like I don't want to go to a busy restaurants because that means I'm exposed to more risk. So people prefer to change quickly. Um, and, um, and so, so if you just keep the model in productions because the environment has changed and the distribution has changed, it will no longer um, it will no longer be good. So there's a saying that like a machine learning model is uh, achieve best performance just right after uh, just right before deployment, and as long as stay in productions, the worst of performance you're gonna get. And here's a uh, a trick to like measure decay or like quantify the quality, the value the value of data freshness. It's like to try uh, train the model on the data generated from like a month ago and then a week ago and then a day ago and test on the data from today to see how much performance gains you get. So another myth is that like you don't would need to update the models as much. It will say, it will usually ask me like, so how often should I update my model? So the question should be like, how often should I update? Uh, how often like, it's not like, the question shouldn't be how often should I update my model, but it should be how often can I update my model? So you want to update the model as humanly possible, as fast as humanly possible. The reason is that like the longer the you wait to update, the, the worse the model performance you're gonna get. So that's something that I think machine learning field can learn a lot from DevOps. So in DevOps right now, there's a trend where like the top performers, top companies are like way, way, way faster than other companies. For example, the um, top performers, there's a research by Google DevOps um, recently. I think it's a really great research if you want to look at it. Um, so top performers deploy like almost a thousand times more frequently and with like 6,000 times like faster time to deploy than like uh, other performer. And the same trend I'm seeing in machine learning where some companies deploy the model like once a quarter and some companies deploy the model like every five minutes. So yes, if you want to go into machine learning or have machine learning knowledge, like try to learn more about DevOps. I feel like it can be a very valuable set of skills. Um, and the last myth is that like uh, machine learning can magically uh, transform the business uh, overnight. 
I think it's a lot of like hype on machine learning and when company like use machine learning, they expect that like, okay, are you machine learning now? I'm an unicorn now, but it's not true. So it, it, it can transform the business, but it's not going to be overnight. So the reason is that like the longer, um, the more, um, so the longer you have a double machine learning, the more mature the setup is, the more efficient your system is going to be. Um, so the, the efficient improves with maturity. So um, the, uh, here's a study by Angora Mia. I think it's very interesting. It shows that like the longer a company uh, has adopt machine learning, the faster the iteration cycle, the faster the time to deployment is going to be. And because you can deploy the model faster, first you can save engineering money, engineering uh, costs, because you take, require less engineering time. And the second, you can boost the model performance better. So, um, yes, yeah, so I think it's saying this like machine learning engineer is more engineering than machine learning. Is that something I keep telling my students? Um, so, like machine learning engineers, you might spend most of uh, your time like rumbling data, understand data, setting up infrastructure, deploying model instead of choosing machine learning model. And I think this will pick up my career when I post this like a random tweet and you know, must like agree with it. So, so yeah, so, um, if, if you have to choose between machine learning and engineering, like always choose to become a better engineer. And that is my talk. And here are some of the resources that might help uh, if you're interested in learning more. And I'm going to pass um, it to Jelly. Thank you so much, Chip. Hello, everyone. My name is Jelly. It is my pleasure to share the story of my career today with you. My first post-graduation job was in Seattle, where one of the most popular activities was hiking. As a city person, I learned to enjoy hiking and mountains. Mountain climb resembled the journey of my career growth. One of the things I learned was to hike with a group. In my career, I have cultivated a network of, um, of women who supported me as my mentors, coaches, and sponsors. I will share a story of each in this talk. My career began when I attended graduate school. I moved to the United States in 2009 to get a doctoral degree in psychology because I wanted to be a professor in one day. Four weeks before my dissertation defense, I was approached by an Amazon recruiter for their open positions. Three hours after I completed my dissertation defense, I flew to Seattle for an onsite interview scheduled for the next day. Two days later, I got a job offer. After a week of consulting and reflecting, I decided to take the offer to work as a research scientist at Amazon HR department. This started my journey in tech and forever changed my career in a positive way. After six months at Amazon, I decided to move to become a data scientist. Back in 2015, data science is still an emerging field and there was little known um, outside of large uh, technical companies. I was fortunate that Amazon provided me extensive the technical exposure and a rare opportunity to pave in my career into a more technical role. However, the venture of career pivot was more like an uphill battle, like I climbing the mountain all the time. When I started hiking, I found myself a mentor to guide me, who gave me tips on where to start, what to prepare, and then how to do it based on her experience. I needed a mentor for data science. What are mentors? Mentors are those people who help you share their experience, give advice, and offer suggestions for your problems. University of Washington research in 2017 shows that female uh, engineering students who were paired with a, a peer female engineer um, had high satisfaction, confidence, and then retention compared with those who did not have one. Veronica is my most important career mentor. She was introduced by one of my coworkers at Amazon. While I was chatting about the technical challenges I was facing, he mentioned that he know a brilliant data scientist and then kindly made an introduction. I asked for a formal mentorship with Veronica after first call and then set up by weekly meeting afterwards. I felt a strong connection with Veronica from the beginning which I did not have before. Both of us migrated to the States in our 20s. Both of us completed our PhD in here. 
both of us work in that area is predominantly alpha male. We are usually the only female presented in the technical meetings. Because of my career pivot, I needed to learn a lot of technical skills from scratch. Cloud computing, data engineer, data pipeline, data warehouse, even Python programming. I had only took two computer science classes as an undergraduate student. Feeling overwhelmed was a serious understatement. Veronica helped me tremendously identifying resources and areas that I could improve. And then she shared her experience, how she kept up with the um, fast, rapid growing area of machine learning. Veronica also inspired me to be a data scientist who can widely select and apply proper machine learning methods to solve problems so the business can make meaningful changes. I used to think machine learning is all about sophisticated engineer modeling and performance. I had always tried to run this big, shining, large concept of models in work to prove that I was a skilled data scientist. However, Veronica shared her experience running a um, regular regression model to discover important factors um, in packaging reduction, which led senior leaders to make a decision to change their processes. It is not always about running a deep learning model or optimizing an engineer um, performance, she said with a deep Australian accent. It is more about to help the business solving problems how to scope the, pro, uh, the questions, how to find and understanding data, how to test assumptions, and how to choose a method that help the business. After more than three years at Amazon, I began another journey at Microsoft as a data and applied scientist, where I encountered my first career coach, Kim. Kim and I met on the first day in the company. She was one of the hosts of new hires. Once the session ended, I scheduled a one-on-one -on -one with Kim because I knew I needed a mentor to help me navigate a new role in a new company. During the meeting, Kim told me that she's a certified career coach and would be happy to help either as a coach or as a mentor. She explained what coaches are. Career coaches are those people who help you gain clarity expanded your creativity, and then discover solutions for your challenges. Instead of sharing experience and providing advices as mentors do, coaches help you to solve the problem on your own because they believe you are capable to solve the problems successfully. After clarification, I decided to work with Kim as my mentor, sorry, as my coach for 10 to 12 sessions. During the process, Kim actively listened to my questions and then asked a clarification questions, which helped me think clearly, identify opportunities, and then de develop solutions on my own. One example is that how she helped me to um, go through a stressful time period during a coaching session. I tended to spin on a problem nonstop when I couldn't think through a solution. I brought up the topic with Kim. She listened carefully and asked me to imagine I was the pilot of the airplane and she hold onto the wheel tightly and then put your feet on the brake and gas. Remember to breathe. Where did you want the airplane to go? Kim asked softly. How could you make it happen? What could prevent the airplane getting there? After answering the questions one by one, I felt much calmer and confidence that I can solve the problem as I now already have a plan. Even though I never had a mountain climbing coach, my fitness coach helped me tremendously by creating fitness goals, building healthy habits, and then gain physical strength and agility. He prepared me with the physical strength and the agility to climb a more challenging route. I feel more relaxed and energetic nowadays for the hard hikes. The first time I heard about sponsor was during an internal female tech meeting group 
at Microsoft. Who are sponsors? Sponsors are people connect you with your breakthrough career opportunities, support and promote you for career advancement, and they even look for your next stretch of segment. Liberty is my sponsor for both hiking and then development. She's so passionate about nature that she ends her email with a signature quote. There's no such thing as bad weather, just bad gear. Go outside. Liberty spends most of her weekends on hiking, backpacking, snowshoeing, depends on the weather. For my hiking explorations in the Pacific Northwest, she helped me to find a route when I didn't know which one is the best and then which one is more scenic. Liberty and I were introduced by my first manager at Microsoft, who considered Liberty as a great connection for me for my onboarding. We were probably the only two psychometricians in the company. During my first meeting, I found out Liberty and my PhD advisor graduated from the same program. Yes, psychometric is such a small world. Everyone pretty much knows everyone. Even though there was no formal um, coaching or mentorship, Liberty and I still kept meeting regularly. We talked about psychology, research, and certifications while we were walking the trails near the Microsoft campus. Or we just chat about hiking and the food when we run into each other in the kitchen. During my second year at Microsoft, we talked about the projects we are planning to do for the new physical years. Liberty mentioned her goal was to use machine learning to innovate the Microsoft certification program. And then she explored some options outside the company. I said, well, you are talking to a data scientist. I want to help. Liberty and I started discussing the applications and then the priorities for her program. Eventually, we decided to leverage natural language processing models for certification development. We aligned our goals, lay out the detailed plans, identified the risks and the barriers, and then wrote a proposal. We pitched to our managers and then got approval. Once the execution started, Liberty and I met biweekly for updates and discussions. These projects led my career into the advanced and then specialized domain of machine learning. How did I build my own career network? I summarize it into three steps. First, be curious and learn. Understand what crucial problems your, organiza your organizations are trying to solve. How my experience and skill sets can help. And then which leaders help grow female talents and fill female leadership roles. Second, create a network map. A network map is a way to systematically tracking your network. One of my managers at Microsoft kept a detailed spreadsheet with all stakeholders whom our team interact with in a frequent or infrequent manner. I learned to create my own network that who are my stakeholders, collaborators, mentors, and the sponsors, which areas that they care about and where my interests overlap with them, how I can help them, and where I can contribute. Third, ask. I understand it could be un uncomfortable to ask to assign to a high visibility projects or even lead an initiative that you are interested in. I usually frame the ask from the perspective that I can bring unique value to the project. I want to help and I can help. It is usually easier to ask who I should connect with or how I could help, or even ask for a referral. You will be pleasantly surprised how many people are happy to help. About four months ago, I was hired by Facebook as a senior user experience researcher, where I started to think about what types of leader I wanted to be. I see myself as a servant leader who value humility, empowerment, trust in peers, employees, and the customers. It is my responsibility to pay it forward so that women, minority, and immigrants would have much better opportunities and experience than I had. I would not be where I am 
without all those people who helped me. I pre continued presenting machine learning talks in internal and external group, which facilitated learning and sharing. I signed out to be a career ambassador for hiring events. And then hopefully I will be trying to soon become a technical in, uh, interviewer because research has shown that um, some of the hiring managers have bias against minority candidates in tech. I also started mentoring graduate students who wanted to break into tech and machine learning while I was teaching at a graduate program. When I look back, hacking is a relationship building activity as I have always hiked with a group. To climb the uh, career mountain, I found my mentors, coaches, and sponsors through creating a network. I also learned to create, uh, pay it forward to help others. I hope today's talk will help your career adventure in machine learning. Start to build your own network, find your own a mentor, a coach, or a sponsor. Pay it forward when you can. Thank you for listening. Please join me to welcome Noel. Hello, I am so, I, oh my gosh, we've had such incredible speakers. I've like taken a ton of notes. <laughs> so I'm so grateful to be here with you. I am Noel Silver, and I'm going to start by just sharing a little bit about myself. I'm not a traditional candidate for an AI ML career, though that's very much what I have today. I will start by sharing a little bit about a different world, right? But that there is two ways that you can operate in this kind of newfound passion and now developing skill set in machine learning. And what I tend to do is talk about your ability. It's really the same exact skill set, but how you choose to use it in the world. One is, an, is as an intrapreneur, which is something that I spent most of my career doing but then also as an entrepreneur and how similar those journeys can be um, and, and what opportunity lies for you, for you there. All right, hopefully this will work. <laughs> so this is me, this is my gaggle of people. I have the honor and um, pleasure of raising, including my dad who lives with me. But I show you this very briefly to share with you that we are all of course human. We all come from a background. We all have a history. And many of us, what is our history? What is our life? It drives our decisions to get into the worlds that we get into, in my case, into artificial intelligence. My son there at the bottom, he's in, or over, I guess, on the side, he's in the pool. We live in Florida. He was born with Down syndrome 16 years ago. And in that moment, I remember the geneticist sitting me down. He was my first child. And she was like, you know, it, it's, the world's not really meant for him. You probably want to give him up for adoption, put him in an institute. Lucky for him and me, I'm a technologist. And so I saw a different path. And I find that many of us technologists are can be empathetic in a way that the industry doesn't know. It's why it's so critical and important for many of us to step into a world, a crazy unknown world of artificial intelligence and machine learning, but do it because it not just helps our customers and our bottom line, but it actually opens the world up to people who maybe never had access to it before. Of course, my phone locked up, so we'll see. Oh, good, okay, it's reconnecting right now. Um, so next slide, please. I had a really great run <laughs> over the last few years. So I wanna give you a little bit of history, but my, my beginnings were pretty humble. Um, in high school, I was told three months prior to graduation from my economics professor, you will never graduate from high school. I will not, that's not something I see you doing. It's not something I will allow you to do. And, and it was very interesting because I remember being alone and looking around being like, like legit, you're really gonna not let me graduate. And it was very spiteful in the moment, but what I uncovered and also was that he then told me, but you're really good at customer service. You should go do that thing. And rather again, than believe him, <laughs> which is what many of us do. We believe the naysayers and those who cannot see the future we see for ourselves. I decided to go to college. Granted, I had good SAT and ACT scores. So I went to university, but I wasn't really served there either. I was not 
ever really into the world of PhDs, though, if someone wanted to give me an honorary one, I'm so into that. <laughs> but as it stands right now, I'm not going back to school and do, that's just not who I am. Who I ended up uncovering that I am is a quick starter, an idea generator, a, right? Like I have vision. I want to connect people's problems to solutions. And as I've evolved in my career, and these awards just represent that, as I've evolved in my career, I've been able to be the glue. In some companies, we call that a technical program manager, which is how I found a lot of success at Amazon and Microsoft. But we are the glue because we not only understand the business, we also understand deeply the technology. I'll tell you, I wrote over, um, oh gosh, I did it again. I wrote over a hundred applications in the early days of Amazon Alexa. I was employee 10 on the skills team, early, early entry. And in doing that, I, I ended up getting over a million unique users of those skills. And here's another fun fact. Everyone around me, granted, they didn't look like me. They didn't talk like me. They didn't have brown hair, like curly, like mine. But they all told me, your kind of skills won't really work there. <laughs> like, we're building something for the 1% of the 1% to talk in their kitchen. And your skills are like mindfulness and kindness. And, you know, like, that's not really a good spot for you. It turned out they were very successful. So when you have these ideas, you will always be seen as an outlier, but it's not a bad thing, especially today. So what I want to do next slide, please, is talk to you about the ability for us to really take advantage of the inner journey inside of a company. Some of you may have in your heart, like, I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to start my own gig. I will tell you, um, after having started two successful and many unsuccessful entrepreneurial <laughs> ventures, that that is, it's not for everyone. But I will tell, I want to share with you first, though, why I continue to choose to work with large companies. Today, I work for Red Hat, specializing in artificial intelligence and machine learning. And next slide, please. And so to become, the reason I'm passionate about this is because sure, we could all start startups. We could all go and become entrepreneurs. We could all have our single person companies. The reality is the statistics are not super grand about building the billion dollar industry that employs 20, you know, tens of thousands of people. And so what I got passionate about was how do I, how do I change or how do I provide my perspective into these companies? Here's some sad facts in today's companies. Look at that sliver, the little yellow sliver. That's us. That is women. That is minorities. That is, or I should say people of color, African-Americans, Native Americans. Don't even get me started on people with disabilities, right? And these perspectives are exactly what we need in the world of artificial intelligence your voice, your perspective, your ideas, exactly what we need. And we need them in big companies. I was so great to see our friends working at Google and Facebook. I've worked at Amazon and Microsoft. Like they need us to provide perspective that a potentially homogeneous environment may not be able to cultivate. So I mentioned this also because I loved what Jalen, thank you for mentioning the power of network and asking good questions, because that's also something that we can offer. Right, as, as part of someone with a unique perspective in the room, I'm always the one raising my hand and saying, um, so Dad, we thought about this demographic. What about, I know it's crazy, what if my son wanted to use this, right? Just my innocent mom wanting to help out her child, I changed the trajectory of, of a project that impacted hundreds of millions of people. And that's what you can do. The good news, next slide please, is that this isn't necessarily hard to do. Um, I would say it's simple, not trivial, maybe is a good way to put it, right? I did not natively know AI until I dove in and started building. I really love Chip, you had mentioned this at the beginning. Uh, I'll have to mention crying and praying, right? Yes, that was me. <laughs> uh, but crying and praying, but also, learning by doing, getting in there. And I built a model from scratch twice with zero classical education, but I did it because it's how I acquire skills. It's how I, Noel, acquire skills. It's how I learned to build Alexa applications, like 
skills. I went in and just started building them. I built over a hundred in a year. Like I figured it out. So learn by doing, it's a great way to prove to yourself that you don't need any background or nascent experience. Your parents could have done nothing like this. Your children could do nothing like, like you can be unique and learn what we need as a world society. We need your perspective and you can learn to be part of this industry by just being willing to practice and do the work. I do say default to yes as a principle because that's how I got into Alexa. When the email went out inside Amazon saying we're building a new team, we're not sure if it's going to be successful. I saw that email and of course immediately was like, that sounds cool. I went to my hiring manager and they were like, I'm not sure you're technical enough to, to do that work. And maybe in that moment, because I was a training manager or something at the time, they were probably right in their perception of me, but that is never the truth. We know the truth, right? We know what's inside of us and the problems we're here to solve. And so I said yes to that, even though my outsiders were like, I'm not sure. That's okay. I'm sure. And I went after it and it changed the trajectory of my career. And then the last thing I'll mention about entrepreneurship is documenting your journey. It's why I'm on this stage today, because I chose in the most vulnerable times when things were breaking, when I was in a project I felt was failing, I talked about it out loud on stages and podcasts in blog posts, <laughs> right? And it was in that transparency that people realized that they could do this too. So you can be that person one step ahead of another one wondering, if they're all alone trying to figure it out. And the reality is we're not. Okay, next slide, please. So be prototypical, um, be, you know, use, and I say be prototypical, kind of an, a play on words, but build prototypes. It's never been easier, regardless of your technical background, to build a prototype that represents your idea. There are low code, no code ways to do this. Google, Microsoft, Amazon, all the big companies, right, have technology that you can use. And you, you do need to learn how to code a little. <laughs> it's helpful, but it's not unachievable, especially because you have a, a world of us waiting and ready to mentor and support you along the way. And of course, there is open source. It's how I learned to write code in general. I went and looked at books at Barnes & Noble, oh, back in the day when we hung out at Barnes & Noble. <laughs> but I looked at books, I did coding exercises. Now I go to GitHub, I, I model and learn from GitHub repos. This is, the world is accessible to you in a way it's never been before. And here's the trick, and I'm gonna end with this because I want us to have time for questions. The trick is, is everything I just told you about being an entrepreneur, you could do this, of course, inside a company. You can build prototypes for your ideas. You can create something real using artificial applied AI models and show to your manager, oh my gosh, look, this thing could work. But guess what? You could also take that one thing, which is not an uncommon path, build that one thing and realize this is a company. I could do this. I could get funding. I could get support and sponsorship. So all the things I just mentioned are really the keys to doing both, whether you choose to work for a company uh, and have their nice money to use or build a startup and get your own funding and get your own customers. Learn by doing, say yes to opportunity even when you're scared and leverage the world's resources through open source. I am Noelle Silver, I'm so excited to be here. I'm gonna hand it back to Priya so that we can have some time to take some questions. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Noel. Wow, that was super inspirational. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for all our, to all our speakers as well. We'll now, we'll now get into the Q&A portion of this breakout session. Uh, and our first question is, um, when do you know it's time to stop the model development iteration? What standards do you use? Uh, which metrics, fairness, um, Chip, do you want to take this? Or uh, maybe Jalin, if you want to take this? Yeah, I can start. Um, the question is when to stop, right, uh, for the machine learning model. For me, I always started with business and then business questions and what type of questions we want to solve. 
and then connect with business to understand where the um, the line they are trying to um, to cut. So for different business, they have different tolerance in terms of the accuracy and the performance of the model. Um, I usually communicate with my stakeholders along the way, start from the building the model and then iterate through to keep making sure to engage with the business and then to make sure the business is fully on board. To be fair, sometimes the business um, stakeholders are not necessarily the best person to understand the technical detail. But I think as a technical um, person, it is our responsibilities to make sure that we can communicate, communicate effectively with the business to understand the different um, decisions we are trying to make in our um, decision process. Thank you. Um, thanks, Jalen. Uh, all right, let's move on to the next question. Uh, in most companies, data engineering tasks have more priority than machine learning initiatives. What is your advice to accelerate the adoption and prioritization of uh, ML? Um, uh, do we have Chip here? Uh, Chip, do you want to take this? Hey, um, this is an interesting question. I, I, I don't think that engineering is uh, orthogonal to machine learning. So as in like data engineering has priority, doesn't mean machine learning has to take the back seat. I actually think that's the vast majority of the work needs to be done in a machine learning workflow is in data engineering. And data engineering is needed to enable the success of a machine learning project. So, um, Yes, so I I don't think it's a bad trend at all that the engineering is being prioritized, but maybe other people have different views. I would only add that um, one of the nice things about if you are on a machine learning team and you're trying to make yourself like, hey, I have currency and I'm like my work is worthy, is creating quick wins for the business. Because oftentimes, because just like what Chip said that that process of doing data engineering tends to take the lion's share of the effort and attention. Create quick wins with your model so that people can see this is why we're doing that work, right? This is the business outcome you're getting, even if it's not perfect, but just to give them that visibility. At least, again, I come from kind of the business side and I'm always like, well, what's this model going to do? <laughs> right? Like, how is that going to work for us? And I saw maybe some others want to chime in. Um, great. Thanks, Noel. Uh, so yeah, uh, I think your talk was really inspirational. Would you say you're an entrepreneur right now or an entrepreneur? And how do you choose between the two? Uh, thanks for that question. Yeah, I am both. Um, and I encourage it. I, I don't know. I am of the mindset that side hustles are okay. Um, I believe in virtuous cycles in our lives that we should keep doing things that drive us. And sometimes you get in an entrepreneur or inside a company and you might be in a season where you're doing something you don't absolutely love but that's okay it doesn't mean you just leave right it means you then maybe try to find other things so i've gone through multiple seasons where i'm doing some fun side hustle and then i learn something and bring it to my job and it becomes the thing that i've then become popular for or, or um productive in in my work so yeah i do both um, but I think it's where do you find the most joy? Do you like being in a fully functional company that has people and money? Or do you like being on the edge where it's a little bit more chaotic? Um, like I said, I like living on both sides. <laughs> Thanks for asking. Great, great. Uh, thank you so much. All right, everyone, it's time to wrap up. Uh, thank you again to all of our amazing speakers. Uh, that was great and I learned a lot. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.